Hey everybody, this is Jeremiah Craig coming out to you for another episode of Ask the Bootmaker. Today we have Stephen Christo of Perrin Creek Custom Boots, and we're going to get him in here in just one second. First, I just want to tell you guys about the Try Easy Boot Jack that I have. This is made by Twisted Willow Fabrication, and right now we are doing a free engraving of these for the folks who buy them during the holidays. So uh, you get whatever you want engraved in the side here. Uh, just make sure that when you order to wait for my email back to thank you for your order and to find out what you want engraved on here that's unique to you, your own custom engraving, and we'll make it happen. So check out these boot jacks, all aluminum, made in the USA. Uh, aluminum, except for the guards and stainless steel hardware here. These things are awesome, and they really are tough. I ran one over with my car twice, and it still works fine. <laughs> so if you guys are interested in getting something special this Christmas and engraving it, you can do that. Just go to jeremiahcraig.com slash store, and you can get your Try Easy boot jack there. All right. Now that we have that little ad out of the way, let's get Steven Christo in here from Perrin Creek Custom Boots. Bringing them in. Here we go. Hey, Steve, how's it going? Good. How are you, Jeremiah? Great. Is everything set up okay? Yes. Yes, it yep. looks great. Wow, your shop looks amazing. Well, thanks. Yeah, it's a uh, it's a big old timber frame building I designed on CAD uh, just to be a boot shop. Wow, that is it's so. Tell me a little bit about since we just jumped right into the uh, timber frame shop. What is it you made it yourself with your son? Is that correct? Yeah, he helped me uh, especially towards the end. Yeah, by pretty much. Um, I designed it in CAD. I used, uh, uh, I laid out my equipment and just kind of designed it around it. And I, uh, you know, lots of natural light. I put, I put uh, big windows in where the stitching machines are. And um, we milled 330 logs to do this. You did it um, yourself. Uh, well, I, I have a friend with a, a portable sawmill and he came and ran the mill and uh, my son and I, uh, uh, and we hired a, a couple teenagers from the neighborhood to, 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 to move the boards as they came off the mill. And I'll tell you, it's a huge job just keeping the sawdust clear of the mill. You know, when you get into full swing, I mean, you're hauling wheelbarrows of, of sawdust continuously. So we made a, it's a lot of work, but uh, it was fun, man. Just the, the smell of the wood being cut was fantastic. I enjoyed it so much. No doubt. And, uh, and you got to make your own uh, shop yeah. with its own personality. It must be so awesome coming into your shop every day, knowing that you built it and also having such a beautiful natural lighting. I can see it's a beautiful day just because the sun is shining on you right now. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of uh, uh, open space here. I mean, the, the floor space is pretty crowded with, crowded with equipment, but, uh, you know, it, it with these high ceilings, I mean, you can see the, the atrium. Wow. That's like a 30-foot atrium, so you got a lot of overhead space, and it's uh, it just feels good. It feels right, you know. Nice. I just can't wait to get over here every morning. <laughs> I don't blame you. What do you got in the upstairs area? So I have a loft that was going to be a, a, an art studio, but I haven't, uh, I haven't developed that yet. I mean, it's finished off, but I've been so busy with boot making. I haven't had time to do anything else. It sounds like a good problem to have though. I, I'm not minding it at all. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you went to school for art and we're actually a, a, an art professor for a while. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I've taught at three uh, universities, art, fine art, studio art. And uh, my focus was mostly uh, clay and glass and sculpture. 
but I did as an undergrad minor in architecture and engineering. Um, I'll tell you, the reason I didn't go into engineering or architecture was that, you know, I, back then your drawings were on paper and I'd hand them in and, and, and the, the students were just awful, man. They would take your drawings, erase your name because it's all on in pencil and put their names on them. Oh. And I decided like halfway through college, I didn't want to work with those kind of people. So I went over to the art department. No regrets. Nice. Plagiarism <laughs> is a little bit harder in the art department, huh? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you've been uh, doing boots for like six or seven years, if not 10, but full time for the past 14 months. Is that yes. correct? That's so what correct. has that jump been like uh, over the past 14 months of doing custom boot making full time? Oh, it, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm learning so much. And, and, you know, I really enjoy learning. And that keeps me going. It's, uh, it, it just never ends with boot making. Every pair is different. And, um, you know, the, it, it's, it's also very technical, especially in getting the fit, you know, and um, I mean, I, I, I just can't tell you how much I've learned over these last 14 months. It, it's uh, I'm, I'm beginning to understand it, just beginning. You know, I was doing everything by rote um, from from my teachers, and um, uh, now I'm I'm starting to see why things are done the way they are, especially in terms of measurement, and, uh, fitting the last, and all that. But it's it's exciting. It keeps me interested. If I if I wasn't interested, I wouldn't be doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's being interested and ex and it makes you want to explore a lot more. What Absolutely. made you want to explore it to begin with? I mean, there must have been something that sort of piqued your interest at first to make you go, "Hey, I'm going to give custom boot making a shot." Yeah. Well. Uh, okay. So, I mean, I I always liked cowboy boots. I wore them as a child, but uh, as I grew, it was harder and harder to fit my feet. You know, I started to become more aware of my feet and, and, and how they, they fit in the boots. And I mean, I, with adult feet, I just could not find a pair of comfortable boots. And I, I, I guess I was about 60 when I just, the idea came to my head that you know what, if other people can make footwear, maybe I could, you know, make something that fits me. So, uh, and living in Virginia, of course, there's no boot makers around that, that, that could have done that for me. So I, I ventured off on my own. I went to Tandy Leather, bought a, a, a bison hide, a one-off thing they had in a sale bin. And uh, looked on the internet, there was very little back then, uh, I'm talking maybe seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, so I, I said, what the heck, I'm just gonna start and see what happens. And it, it, I, I made a pair of boots, but um, they looked like crap, but they felt <laughs> great. So I decided to explore it a little more. And I saw that uh, Carl Chapel offered a, a, a class down in uh, St. Joe. Went down there and took that. Uh, my wife actually went with me and she, she took the class as well. And I was hooked, man. So I, I got Lisa's um, CDs. And you know, when you take Carl's class, you get a, a book and some CDs also, which are invaluable. I mean, I bet you I spent more time reviewing the material than I spent making the first few pairs of boots this year. So um, they're, they're really helpful. And, and then uh, I uh, had an opportunity to go to Penland and take Lisa Sorrell's inlay and overlay class. Um, and it, it was great. She's great to work with. So that, that gave me a lot of confidence. And, and I, and I always wanted to get into art, back into art uh, when I retired from the physics lab. 
I just didn't know what medium, you know, I would be working with. Um, and I just decided boots would be the medium. I love it. it there's so much blank canvas to use on boots. Absolutely. It's, a, it's amazing. And, and the other thing about boots is not only is it, a, you know, you have this huge canvas, you know, to work on with, it's a, it's a beautiful form cowboy boots. I mean, it is the ultimate manifestation of form follows function, which makes it even more elegant. Um, and then if you can get a design to work with that form, all the better. No doubt. Just had a question come through in the live chat from Moose. He wonders if you still have those first boots that were so comfortable but didn't look that good just sitting around or even do you wear them still? Um, I do occasionally. I don't have them here with me, but uh, um, they're still around. I've resold them twice already. Um, and, and the only reason I've had to resold them twice is because I didn't know from good sole leather when I made them. <laughs> and it was, it was some Tandy uh, soling bends. Man, you go through those things like they were butter. <laughs> Uh, what determines good leather soles now pardon me what determines good leather soles well it, it you know it's the way it's tan um lisa's soling bends come from england it's a baker leather and they must pound the crap out of it because it's it's like wood although it's still flexible mm -hmm. but they last much longer than uh than those Candy soles. Were those soles uh, bonded leather? Is that why they were so? Uh, no, weak? no, it was just, uh, I, it, 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 it's a lot less dense than, okay. than the Baker leather. So I'm guessing they, you know, they, they didn't tan it as well and they didn't compress it as well. Interesting. So you mentioned that you did some science work, some nuclear physics work before uh, get, jumping into custom cowboy boots. That's like com two completely different worlds. Can you tell me about how you got into this uh, field of science? Yeah, well, I was always interested in science. And like I said, I had a, a minor in uh, uh, architecture, which gave me a design background and engineering you know so so I, I like numbers i like math and i was teaching at lsu at the time um our professors make about a third as much money as anybody else in the same position so this was in the mid 1980s as an associate professor i was making nineteen thousand five hundred dollars a year and that was okay, as long as I could sell my work and, and so forth, until we had a baby. <laughs> now do it. And then, and then it, there, was, there was no way, no way. I mean, I, I had a doctor uh, friend in New Orleans, who, who a pediatrician who, who traded artwork for medical care, you know, and all the prenatal stuff. But even with that, you know, I had to start saving for college and all this stuff. So, so I walked across the quad at LSU and, and approached the physics department. And uh, they needed help, so I jumped in, doubled my salary overnight, just as a technologist. And uh, so, you know, the kind of work building. Uh, well, what I was doing was was building uh, uh, subatomic particle detectors, and you know, there. If we had time, I could explain it to you. I think in a way that that you could understand how they work pretty easily, um, but it, it requires a lot of precise work. Um, it requires craftsmanship. You know, there's so many things that can go wrong electrically. You're working with high electric fields and so forth. 
And, you know, those are skills that artists have, you know, being careful, blue, working with little tiny things and, um, you know, uh, an understanding of materials. And from there, um, I, I went to uh, several labs around the world, actually, and learned the stuff. They, they don't teach this to physicists. So it's, it's nothing you could learn in a class. You have to learn by doing it and reading papers and so forth. So I uh, then had an opportunity um, to come to Virginia or back to Virginia, I should say, uh, when they built a new accelerator nearby here in uh, Newport News. So they scooped me up and I, uh, I stayed in physics probably 33 years, 34 years. Wow. But yeah, in fact, I can show you a couple. At, at Jefferson Lab, I, I became a, a specialist in uh, cryogenic targets. So this is a, a typical target cell. And the rest of the target is massive. It's uh, it's a refrigerator that cools um, liquid hydrogen or helium, helium free or deuterium to fill up this cell. And the beam, uh, in the case of our lab, it was an electron beam would come in this direction. And then uh, the beam, the electrons would hit the target material and just bust up the nuclei and they'd go scattering through the detectors that we built, which were massive. I mean, hundreds of thousands of wires, smaller than a human hair, all of them had to be strung by hand. And uh, it was, it was, a, it was pretty fun. Actually. It sounds Big awesome. Projects. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you're literally coming from nuclear physics, which is a relatively new technology to cowboy boots, which is relatively old and proven. <laughs> so it's like you're balancing art and science in a way that many people don't think about, which has got to be really hard for you to balance in your brain. And the fact that you're able to do it on a regular basis is really impressive. But what did you bring from your time in nuclear physics, building all of these uh, cryogenic particle beam uh, things, and then coming into cowboy boots, uh, where's where's the connection there? Where's the Venn diagram, the middle? It's, uh, well, well, since I was in the, uh, the technical end of it, uh, not the theoretical end, so. Okay. I, uh, you know, I, I work with my hands. Mm -hmm. and, uh, craftsmanship uh, was really important. I brought that from from doing art. Um, the the importance of um, uh, uh, you know just being careful and understanding your materials, um, what you had to work with, fabrication techniques. I mean, I brought stuff from art. To physics more than I brought from physics back to boot making. Interesting. Yeah, it, it's uh, and in my mind, there's not a whole lot of difference between art and science. I don't know how to explain it, but it just seemed natural to me. I, you know, it, it seems like the art has less rules sometimes, and science is all rules. But then when we go to your next career, which is custom cowboy boots, there's like a balance of art and science there, you know, creativity and following the rules that sort of makes sense for the rest of your career to sort of end up at custom cowboy boots. Well, in both cases, you, you have a goal, mm -hmm. right? And the way you approach it is basically the same. Um, it's a... Uh, and I'll tell you, there are also rules in art. And no doubt. One rule, <laughs> one rule that 
that you should take to heart, every artist, is that something that's big and ugly is a lot uglier than something that's small and ugly. Okay, don't forget that. <laughs> How do you apply that to cowboy boots? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Love it. Oh, speaking of all this uh, difficult science uh, careers and, and projects and things, we just had a question from Wesley Metal who came through the live chat. He asks, is there a pair of boots that was exceptionally difficult for you to make that you remember? Mm. Um, Other than your actually, first. Actually, yeah. This, uh, I don't know if you saw the one with the fish. Yes, I got questions trout, about that. Trout mouth, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That, that was, it, it, I had to fool around a lot with that design before I executed it. Yeah, and I even, oh man, I had the fish inlays all dyed, you know, ready to sew into the boots. And I spilled a bottle of dye. There you go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I spilled a bottle of dye on the table and ruined it. So. Oh no. Yeah, and, and co coincidentally, Carl did the same thing in his video. <laughs> so never put your dye an open bottle of dye on the table you're working on yeah. <laughs> i got and a question about that most... those dye processes um because it looks pretty difficult to dye the leather and that's also inlaid yes yes so what is the process of dyeing that leather in a way that it sort of looks like paint but won't wear like paint because i imagine if you painted the boot then it would just flake off yeah well yeah that's right uh although there are some paints that work more or less mm -hmm. i i haven't messed with them but um i think orion calf has some stuff Phoebings has some stuff, but you're right. It, it paints not as durable. It doesn't really go into the fabric as well. So um, dye, uh, you handle just like watercolors. So it's very similar to, to watercolors on paper. If you're using a, you know, an unfinished leather, a crust. Um, in my case. Um, Peter at, at Garland Newman Leather suggested, because uh, uh, I asked him about, you know, leather, leathers that would be suitable for dyeing. And um, he said, well, you know, it, you could just use lining leather. It has no finish on it. It's designed to uh, absorb moisture or dye as well. Um, so, so the dye actually goes into the fabric of the leather and then you finish it off with a, an acrylic um, finish, a clear acrylic finish, you know, you rub it into the thing and it's permanent. I mean, that's basically how they, the, 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 the leathers that you can buy are made, so. How long does that take for you to make a piece of art? with dye do you have to wait for the first coat to dry oh. and then dye on top of that and oh no it's great because it's it's real immediate um, oh wow it's 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 alcohol alcohol based okay so it evaporates really quickly you know and um i mean you it doesn't take any time at all for it to dry so how long did it take for you to make the entire piece of that trout mouth inlay uh, with dye, like an afternoon? Oh no, because <laughs> <laughs> it, it was the first time I, I tried anything like that. It, it, it took me about, I don't know, four or five days. Wow. I'd try something and then throw it away and try something else. You know? Next time it might you know, take a day, maybe two, but now that I know how to do it.
it's something that you're looking forward to doing again, maybe? I am. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a different, if, if I had done the same design, all inlay or all stitching, it would have a whole different character. And, you know, that's something I have to keep in mind too. You know, what do you want the character of the boot to be? And that depends a lot. That, that determines the technique you want to use. So. It seems like you're um, playing around with a bunch of different techniques, not only with the dye, which looks great. Those boots turned out spectacular, in my opinion. But also Thanks. with the patchwork. Uh, I saw that you did a really bright, punchy looking patchwork yeah. type boot uh, recently. And I'm wondering what is the strength for those folks out there interested in possibly getting some patchwork boots? How do you sew those patches together to make it just as strong as a single piece of leather? Thanks for asking. Yeah, that, that, uh, this is what you're talking about. Yes, patchwork, exactly. Okay, so you see those stitches? Yeah. It, it's a, a zigzag, okay? And these are, are glued with a contact cement to a thin pigskin backing. Interesting. Can you hold up the back a little higher? Yeah. Wow. See that? Yeah. So, so um, this, <laughs> yeah, the, the stitchers we, we use for stitching boot tops, the 3115s primarily, uh, I don't do zigzag, okay? And it, it's a great story, man. I, I was, I have this, had this friend, he passed away, sorry to say, but uh, he, he was a retired steel worker. And, and this guy, he, he just haunted flea markets and yard sales and, and thrift stores. And one day he comes in with his truck with this sewing machine in the back. He says, look what I got for you. <laughs> and it was a Singer uh, 107W. And I looked at it and I, and I, I didn't know what it, a 107W was. And I, I, well, I brought it into the shop, looked it up to get a manual. Turns out it was a Singer machine for shoemakers, among other things. Uh, designed to sew together, but jointed. Uh, apparently in shoemaking, there are some joints, uh, I, I think probably on the inside that are butted together leather. And if you were to do it by hand, you'd whip stitch those together. But this machine was designed to zigzag stitch those, those two pieces together. And not two weeks later, oh, oh by the way, this machine, he picked it up for $21.10. Love it. Love <laughs> at, those thrift finds. At the restore. Yeah, it was amazing. And what that was doing in this county in Virginia, I have no idea. But <laughs> happily, it ended up here. And uh, two weeks later, this girl comes in. She's a champion um, cowboy mounted shooter. I mean, she shoots targets from horseback with a black powder revolvers um, at full gallop. Wow. Impressive. She, she's a firecracker, man. She's an 18-year-old girl, and she said she wanted some patchwork boots in these colors. Love it. But I got just the machine for that. And it's great because uh, – as it, you know, depending on how you set the tension, as it stitches, it, it draws the pieces together as well. So um, it's a great bond and she's been wearing them. Her mom says she never takes them off, never. And, and she brought them in a couple of days ago uh, while she came in wearing them. And the, I was afraid the stitches might wear on her, her saddles. I did, um, put in a, a, some, some leather to protect the stitching from the spurs, okay? But nothing's worn on the stitches at all. 
They look wow. Great. Yeah. So it's very strong. Even even when you crimp it, it yeah. uh I, it was surprising. I mean, it crimped so well. It um uh, and, and what was cool about the crimp in those boots, you could because you had these little squares to start with, how those squares change shape. I was wondering about that. As you crimped it, I think there's a I've got a picture somewhere, uh, uh, but it was really, really nice to see. And you could see how and where the leather was stretching in which direction, which you crimped when you crimped it, which you don't get with just a, a solid color of leather. You don't right. see. So uh, that was also a learning experience. Very cool. Yeah. Um, those boots have made me interested in getting a pair of patchwork uh, boots at some time. Just because, you know, they look so unique and so interesting. And the oh, fact see. that it can be just as strong is, is, is really um, interesting as well. Yeah, she, uh, so I inlaid uh, some butterflies on the tops of those boots as well. And uh, they were pretty colorful. So she comes to pick them up and patches of her hair are all dyed the same colors as the boots. Perfect. <laughs> it, was, it was a great, great job. I love that. It was, uh, yeah, I, I'd like to do more of that kind of stuff. Are there you know? any other techniques that you've been experimenting with, with the dye, the patchwork? What else have you been messing around with that's new to you? Um, well, uh, I been fooling around a lot with you know inlay and overlay um there there are some techniques i i would like to try um taken from vintage boots you know from like the 30s and 40s and 50s um that you don't see anymore especially the uh the, the guys um from um El Paso, that area. Um, Which so, features in general? Yeah, like Rios and those guys. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. which uh, which which part? Like, what are you most interested in about those boots that you want to start messing around with? Uh, it, it, almost a three dimensional um, uh, overlay. Okay. You know, actually, comes up off the surface of the boot. That's really cool. I, I, uh, and then I'd like to work more with, you know, um, uh, gold and, and silver. Oh, nice. Uh, yes. Leather. Yeah. And, and is that hard to get? Actually, no. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> no, it's not. I just picked some up in, uh, in uh, Wichita Falls uh, when I was there in October. Yeah, for the roundup boot makers mm -hmm. round up so yeah you find it it's there um i'd like to do more with uh, lacing you know uh, around the edges and, and side seams and stuff i i i it, that's on my list yeah but cool. I, you know i haven't had time <laughs> i need to schedule time to fool around mm -hmm. just nobody, had a question is going to order a pair of boots like that Maybe in Texas, but Virginia. Well, the more people that know that you want to do stuff like that, maybe it expands the the opportunity for you to get orders like that. I hope so. I really yeah. educate these guys. <laughs> I hope so too. So with you being so busy right now, making a bunch of different custom boots, I just had a question from Neil in the live chat. Uh, do you have time to make yourself pairs of boots or to maybe test these things out for your own collection? That's a good question. I, I, I don't right now. Um, uh, when I when I was first starting out, I did, and I'm wearing a pair now of mine, but um, no, not yet. Uh, if, if I had time, I would probably make boots for my wife rather than myself right now, just because I have boots and um, she never has enough. So, yes. And, and, and so she's a good vehicle for testing, you know, stuff on. And she's also a good critic. 
she's she's just like relentless <laughs> i uh <laughs> i appreciate it though she she has good ideas so yeah that's perfect uh it's perfect to have <laughs> somebody to uh be able to test things on and get feedback like that yeah you need the feedback i you know and i i envy those guys down down in texas and out west you know they have other boot makers around because you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this stuff in isolation and there's, there's nobody to bounce things over, uh, bounce things across with. And I, I don't know, it, it's an important dynamic that I miss, you know, from being in academia, you have the other teachers, but students too, mm -hmm. who, who give you feedback. And, uh, and so, so I have to, I have to, you know, kind of, if I want to look at uh, uh, my work objectively, which is hard to do, um, sometimes you just have to, to leave it and come back to it, look at it fresh. Or, or another thing I'll do is hold it up to a mirror. It, it looks a lot different in a mirror. Somehow you're able to see it more objectively when you look at it in the mirror than you can just uh, just look, you know, holding it in front of you. Just because it changes the perspective a little bit. It absolutely does, yeah. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. See, that's something that I do when I um, write music. I mean, I'm not, I'm not holding my songs up to mirrors or anything like that, but I will uh, record the song and sort of listen back to it uh -huh. because it's, a different perspective than just playing the song and trying to figure out what you want to change with it. If you even want to keep it. Cause I'm throwing out songs all the time. Yeah, yeah. You know? So I find that recording it, it might be like that sort of mirror aspect that you're talking about because it will play it back and I'm able to listen to it a little bit more objectively than me trying to play, sing and think about how I feel about the song all at the same time. Yeah, I, I understand that completely. But why don't you try playing it backwards, see what happens? Right? <laughs> that sounds like a very fun exercise. <laughs> also, maybe a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> so with you just uh, going full time in the last 14 months, but working at this for years before, you're talking about some of the uh, uh, some of the I guess, struggles that you're having when you're trying to figure out whether you like a new design, look at your designs and your work objectively. Are there other struggles that you are finding that you're having right now, whether it be in the business, marketing, or in the boot making? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, as far as the business goes, because I'm first starting out, I, I, I don't feel like I can charge, you know, uh, what more experienced boot makers are charging um and and really uh so so i've set my price kind of low to start with and i plan to increase some a hundred dollars a year mm -hmm. figuring that in you know six or eight years i should be at a, a level where where i'd feel comfortable charging the, the going rate um and so Probably next year I'll I'll start breaking even because I'm not now, but that's okay. I got social security, so yes. I think that's why why it was designed for bootmakers starting out. There you go. I hope some's <laughs> left over for me when I'm doing this <laughs> as a musician. <laughs> hey, hey, I I I paid that money. That's my money. There you go. <laughs> so. So yeah, as far as business goes, that that's the only thing. Marketing, I don't have any problem. I I, uh, I learned a lot from uh, Dustin Law and uh, Wes Sugar and uh, Jennifer June in their seminars down at Wichita Falls on how to market. And really, it's pretty basic. Instagram, Facebook, website, period. I don't spend any money on advertising and I've got 
quarter, six months out, you know, so I'm, I feel comfortable. That's awesome. That's perfect for everybody watching and listening right now. This is the time to order some boots from Mr. Steven Christo. Um, Cause in six years when everybody knows them, he's going to be charging much more. This is, this That's is right. the time. You got to come down and get measured though. There you go. <laughs> so it's in, you're in Virginia and yeah. do you feel like the internet has sort of helped you connect to your peers like Dustin Lau and West Shugart and Jennifer June a little bit yeah. more and sort of make up for that, um, I guess, that emptiness of not being able to actually communicate with your peers? Absolutely. And, I, and I'll tell you, um, it, it has. But, you know, bootmakers are great people. And uh, Dustin reached out to me. He actually called and, and we had a good talk. He, uh, you know, very welcoming people. And I just feel, you know, comfortable um, and knowing that I could, you know, uh, talk to him anytime about boot making and life in general, I guess. Love it. Yes. I love the, the boot community. It's so uh, welcoming and open and everybody seems to be exchanging ideas pretty freely because I mean, it's a, a century old plus craft oh, it's yeah. very hard for there to be secrets anymore well yeah and if you go you can go back farther to the the shoemakers you know the mm -hmm. europeans that came over here and, and started making boots if you want yeah no but, doubt and, and that's another reason i went into boot making rather than um the media that i uh worked with as an artist before is because of the people. And like I said, you know, I didn't go into architecture because I didn't like the people mm -hmm. that, that I would have to work with the rest of my life. The bootmakers, yeah, they're, they're good people. I, I like them. And I, I really look forward every year to going to Texas and meeting new bootmakers and seeing their work. It's, it's, it's fun, good group. Love it. And you did say that people have to come to Virginia, come to your shop to get measured if they do want a pair of custom boots from you. I just got a question from John Woodrow about that. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I'll tell you, I, <laughs> there, there are boot makers, I think, that, that send a measuring kit out. But uh, the, the kind of measurements I make, I don't think I can do that. It's a uh, um, I take a total of 26 measurements, wow. including, uh, you know, ink prints and, and tracings. And it, it would just be, it, I can't explain to somebody how hard to pull the tape measure, you know, or, you know, I mean, there's a lot of variables involved and, you know, you start changing a measurement a little bit times you know a bunch of measurements you could add up to something that doesn't fit yep so i couldn't guarantee it and i don't feel comfortable you know i mean i've had people call and ask if they could send me a cast of their foot and, but that wouldn't work either because you know some measurements are taken with the weight on the foot and some are with the foot relaxed mm -hmm. i don't know you know, I guess if you if you made two castings, of course you'd probably break your leg trying to hang, uh, you know, thirty pounds of plaster. It doesn't sound very relaxing to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I I I think about it though. You know how to? I'm thinking about it like a simple machine, a mechanism that might be helpful. But when everybody has like 3D printers and um, yeah. those Star Wars or Star Trek duplicators or those things that, you know, just print. Yeah, the, they the, I'm sure they the could foot. take scans yeah. of the foot in a whole bunch of different ways. I mean, that might be something uh, to explore. No, you're right. I've thought about that, too. You know, get a 3D printer and have them scan their feet in different positions. 
We'll see what happens. I don't know. I don't it's know. It's just the beginning the, of the 2000s right now. Haven't looked into it enough to, to know. <laughs> but it would probably uh, increase, yeah, the, the orders, but I don't need it increased just yet. <laughs> nice. Nice. So I got a, a couple more questions here. And one I was going to ask earlier on, but I completely skipped it because we were talking about the shop and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Parent Creek Custom Boots. Am I saying that right? Yeah. Where does that name come from? Okay, so uh, I, I I used to live on the on Perrin Creek um, in Virginia. In Virginia, here in Gloucester, actually. So it was on the water. Uh, you know, we're we're kind of like at the at the confluence of the Chesapeake Bay and the York River, and Perrin Creek was one of the the tributaries. So um, a lot of watermen lived down there, and I started my first business after undergraduate school down in that area. And I just kept the business name all these years. So uh, it's been different businesses, um, but always Parent Creek start. Yeah. 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 I was a production potter back then. This was 1975, right out of undergraduate school. And so it was Parent Creek pottery. Love it. And I had that, I did that for, oh, I, I guess five or six years before I went to grad school. Perfect. Um, my, my parents do the same thing. It's always Twisted Willow something. Yeah. Yeah. No, it just makes sense. It's a lot easier too that the county officials don't get confused. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Love it. So uh, we're wrapping up here. Uh, what are your goals for the future of bootmaking? We talked a little bit about the pricing and in six years, you're going to be um, pretty much up there in pricing with everybody else. You got any other goals that you're looking forward to in this new career of yours? Yeah, well, I mean, I want to make as many boots as possible. It's because uh, you know, I'm old. So it, you know, I, I feel like I got a fire lit under my butt. <laughs> so I want to get crank them out. And, nice. you know, it, it's, it's not really how many years you've been in boot making is how many boots you've made. Okay. I mean, if you make five a year, uh, you probably might not be as good a boot maker as somebody that makes has made 20 a year, mm -hmm. you know, after four years. So, so we'll see that that's one of my goals. Another goal is to, um, uh, you know, meet more boot makers and I'm slowly working on that. It's just it, Wichita Falls is only two days. There are fantastic boot makers there, but, um, you know, by the time you go to the seminars and, and buy leather, there's not a whole lot of time, um, uh, to, to meet people. And, but I did, I did meet Clay Spivy this last time and Jerry Terry. Um, oh, and a couple other guys, Larry, uh, Randy Moe and, uh, Brian, um, uh, Thomas, I think. Anyway, it, it was good. Good talking to them, and and I, I, I uh, I'm going to try to meet some more uh, next time around. Awesome. Um, another goal, I mean, this is years down the line, but <laughs> I really miss teaching. You know, it's a it's a great dynamic uh, between a student and a teacher, um, and I feel I I learn just as much as they do. Um, so so one day. I, I'd like to teach boot making to, to some few people. And I'm set up for it. I've got uh, five 3115s, just, you know, stuff I've picked up over the years. And, and I got the space. So I just don't feel like I have the, the cred yet to do it. 
Well, it sounds like you're making enough boots to get the cred real fast. Uh, and your boots are looking great. Everybody has got to follow Parent Creek Custom Boots on Instagram because <laughs> oh, those are some sweet boots. And it seems like every time you post um, a new pair of finished boots, it's different than the last one. I mean, you, those it was the trout mouth boots with the dye, and then it was the going back the like a few posts before that. It was the the rough out harness boots with the mule ears on them like there's just so many different kinds of boots that you're making it's really fun to watch your instagram right now uh, yeah i have a diverse customer base you know anywhere from uh, executives to musicians I and mean, musicians are fun to make boots for so far <laughs> i really <laughs> enjoy it yeah yeah <laughs> So. Awesome. Well, how can other people get in touch with you besides for your Instagram, uh, you, your website, uh, phone yeah, number, website. like where are you active? Yeah, uh, the website's great. I have a lot of hits on my website. So like 1400 a month. Wow. It, it's uh, it's uh, uh, a com. Two R's in Perrin and all one word. So. Awesome. Steve, thanks so much for taking the time today for Ask the thanks, Bootmaker. This Jeremiah. has been an awesome yeah. conversation. I've really enjoyed. Uh, and with you being so busy, I really appreciate your time as well. Everybody's right. got to yeah. follow Steve Perrin Creek Custom Boots on Facebook, Instagram, and definitely check out the website as well. Thanks, Jeremiah. Good Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.